the, um, the first thing to say is that innovation takes courage. And it reminds me of a story I saw three army generals, one from Britain, one from the United States, and one from Australia, betting each other about whose soldiers have the most courage. And the British general said, well, tell you her, it's, it's the Brits. Watch this. Uh, Jonesy, uh, run up to the top of the building there, will you, boy, and jump off the top. And Jones said, sir, and ran up the top and jumped off the top. And the uh, British general said, there you go, that's, that's courage. And the American general said, no way, watch this. Kowalski, run up the top of the building there, will you, boy, jump off the top and land on your ass. So I ran up the top, jumped off, landed on his backside. And the American general said, there you go, that's courage. And the Australian said, oh, crap, mate, watch this. Uh, Smitty, run up the top of the building there, will you? Jump off the top, uh, do a somersault in the pike position, land on your head, bounce back up and land on your ass. Go to hell, sir, do it yourself. There you go, that's courage. <laughs> Melbourne, the innovation city. And when you would see this title, you would expect that I'm going to talk about things like infrastructure, biotech, information technology. And these are things that Melbourne is certainly a leading city at, and a leading city on the global scale. But that's not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about some innovation that we take so much for granted that we forget that we've done it. And that's some of our social and collective innovation. Let's talk about what we have done, some of the stuff that we take for granted in Melbourne. Firstly, you can drink water from the tap. Because if innovation is something different, something new, something unusual, then we've got to remember that 80% of people on this planet can't drink water from the tap. The fact that we can tap and pipe water through to everyone's house so that we've got an egg timer in our shower so that we have our four minutes and we limit ourselves to 155 litres a day of fresh, clean drinking water pumped to our place is innovative. And it's innovative on a level that we take so much for granted that we forget. Another innovation that we take for granted and forget is the MCG. Being a Collingwood supporter, I love the home of football. Being a Collingwood supporter, I know that we're going to drop the ball sometime between now and September 25, because we always do. MCG, think about it. In how many other cities in the world can you take 80,000 people, cram them into a stadium, mix them all up together, passionately supporting one team or the other, and at the end of the day, everyone goes home without flares, violence or riots? And next time you're at the MCG, as you leave, have a look at how many 12, 13, 14-year-olds are in groups unsupervised. In how many cities in the world could a 14-year-old go up to mum and say, hey, mum, I'm going to a mass public event with 80,000 people and no adult supervision. And mum says, see you when you get home. We take it so much for granted that what we have done in the innovation space as a collective is unbelievable. What we've created in this society is so powerful. In the Committee for Melbourne, we released a report a few months ago, Shaping Melbourne, looking at the future and where we want to go with our infrastructure, with our governance and with our society. And there's a line in this report, and the line is, Melbourne marks the beginning of its current improvement from 1990 when we voted the world's most livable city. And it's a line that people take for granted and they just read through it. But let's unpack that for a second. We mark the beginning of our improvement from when we were voted the best. In other words, we don't hold ourselves collectively to a standard of the top 10 cities in the world. We don't collectively hold ourselves to a standard of the top one. We hold ourselves to a standard where we say, now that we've got to number one, let's get even better still. Let's take our public transport. It is, without a shadow of a doubt, the weakest point of our collective infrastructure. But I challenge you to name more than 10 cities in the world that have a better one. You can pick four pretty quickly. You can struggle to six or seven, but really start to think beyond 10. And that's our weak point. So before I talk about innovation into the future, I want us to start really recognising how far we've come and what we've done as a city and a group and how good we are. We are so bad in Australia at giving credit where credit's due. The tall poppy syndrome we use for individuals but also us as a collective. Having come out of a federal election campaign and soon to come into a state election campaign, of course we're used to negativity. That's the way our politics works. We're bad at this, we're bad at that, we're bad at this. But I say to you, we need to innovate. 
We need to move beyond those public messages that are given to us and say, hang on a minute, no, we are good at this, this, this and this. We just want to get better at this, this, this and this. Like Melbourne, a lot of people say, is an unsafe city. I work at near the corner of Spring Street and Flinders Lane. I live in Docklands. I walked home late last night down Flinders Lane along that really dangerous corner, Elizabeth Street and Flinders Lane. I turned left and then went to that really very dangerous corner, Flinders Street and Elizabeth Street, and kept on walking home. Not a problem. Yes, there are issues of social dislocation and cohesion that we need to address. Yes, there are issues of violence that we need to address. But when anyone says to me, oh, we're a violent city, it's like, I'm sorry, but I did live in Kabul and I did live in Kigali and I think that's a ridiculous statement. And we need to give ourselves credit where credit's due. So what about looking forward? Where can we innovate in the space where the world is changing at the moment? Because I think we're in a really interesting historical convergence point between three things. There is a growing dissatisfaction with the public sector delivery mechanisms of aid and development. We've been pumping billions of dollars over years into countries like the Democratic Republic of Congo and it's still poor. We have a growing professionalisation in community investment and corporate social responsibility programs coming out of the private sector. Many global leading companies are based here in Melbourne, and I'll come to that in a second. And the third point is we've got a growing demand from Generation Y to have a social outcome as part of their work. The city that grabs that convergence space first and innovates around that understanding and comes up with a plan to go forward and how we can really manipulate that space in a positive sense is a city that can brand itself well into the future. And how well is Melbourne planned at this? How well have we already innovated in this space? When we talk about Melbourne, we love to say that we are the number one city for sport, we're the number one for food, we're the number one for culture. If you hear the Premier sometimes, he says we're also the number one for romance, although I'm yet to see that. But we are also the number one for corporate social responsibility, philanthropy and humanitarian affairs in Australia. But we never brand ourselves that way. Think about it. All the big national NGOs, World Vision, Save the Children, the Australian Red Cross, Oxfam, are all in Melbourne. They're not in Canberra. The big philanthropic funds, the Pratts, the Smorgans, the Myers, they're here, not in Sydney. And the global corporate social responsibility of BHP, Rio, ANZ, NAB, Optus, Telstra, SKM, it's all in Melbourne. So we are and we should have as part of our brand image the philanthropic corporate social responsibility and humanitarian hub of Australia. And suddenly we can see that we've got a legitimacy in this convergence point that I was talking about. And how big is this? Is this just a little fluffy thing we have on the side? Let's think about it. BHP Billiton spends 1% of pre-tax profit on community investment programs worldwide. That's 200 million US dollars a year. That makes BHP Billiton the third largest development agency in Australia, larger than the Red Cross. Five companies the size of BHP Billiton spend $1 billion a year. That's the same budget as the United Nations Development Program. In other words, it only takes five companies to spend the same amount of money as the international organisation we rely upon to bring the world out of poverty. It's amazing. The top 100 companies in the world spend $15 billion a year. That's the same budget as the entire United Nations system, including all peacekeeping and political affairs. As a marketplace, it's $59 billion a year, and we don't give it credit as a collective. We still think the way to bring the world out of poverty is double foreign aid. The Democratic Republic of Congo gets 80% of its revenue, the government, from foreign aid. And what does it do with that foreign aid? It represses the people. Surely, instead of talking about doubling foreign aid, we should be talking about doubling aid and development effectiveness. And in most areas of the economy, we don't like seeing a monopoly. Yet we've developed an effective monopoly through public sector delivery mechanisms, the big NGOs and UN agencies, going to a collective pool of money going and delivering programs in a similar way. So rather than poo-pooing the private sector's involvement, surely we should be having a look at A, how big they are, what they're already doing, and start to give credit where credit's due. For example, back to BHP again. Around Mosul and Mozambique, they run an anti-malaria campaign that's reduced adult malaria infections from 74% of the population to 17% of the population. It's warm, it's fluffy, it's good kumbaya singing corporate social responsibility crap. 
and it makes good sound financial sense because the reduction in absenteeism in the workforce caused by the improved health has increased the productivity of their asset by an amount higher than the cost of the program itself. That's innovation. That's out of the box. That's creating a brand new paradigm because up until today, you all thought, I think, that the way of bringing the world out of poverty is to rely on the United Nations and big NGOs. And I'm saying we need to strengthen and encourage the UN agencies and NGOs, but create a competitive parallel system that's invested in the success of the program. We need to change our mindset from development aid, the handout mentality, to development investment. And if you're not comfortable with that, think about this. We look at Muhammad Yunus and uh, Grameen Bank, and we think the microcredit stuff that he's done is great. What he has done is incent legitimised incentivisation at the micro level. What we now need to do is legitimise incentivisation at the macro level. Because if we can coordinate that top 100 companies in the world community investment and share knowledge between each of them and make all of their community investment better, surely the whole world gets better as a result of that. And doesn't Melbourne have a unique opportunity to grab this? Shouldn't we be looking at this as part of our brand image Melbourne? If we are the philanthropic corporate social responsibility and humanitarian hub of Australia, why can't we examine this convergence point between those three things and stand up and say, we will be the global expert at this. We will create the new paradigm into the future around how we can foster the public sector and private sector together to look in at development investment as well as development aid. Why can't we in Melbourne become the private sector version of Geneva? Why can't we at the global level turn around and say, if you want a public sector delivery mechanism, Geneva. You want a private sector delivery mechanism, Melbourne, and bring these two together. Because when we pull out the names of global cities off our tongues, we think New York, a city in the millions, London, a city in the millions, Geneva, a city of less than 400,000. Why isn't Melbourne up there on those names? Because we've not decided that we could. So a challenge that I put to you to begin to think about, to innovate, innovation truly breaking a paradigm, we can continue to innovate in biotech, and we should. And we can continue to innovate in health, as we should. We can continue to innovate in business, as we should. But we have some of the global leading players in capacity building and developing economies through their programs. Do you know ANZ? There's a whole bunch of financial literacy programs in Cambodia. Inherently logical, it sounds nice and warm and fluffy, but also, as they put it, is we like to do financial literacy programs because then we can sell financial products. It's much better for us as ANZ Bank to sell a product to a knowledgeable customer rather than a stupid customer, because a stupid customer will default on the debt. We want people that don't default on the debt. So there is a natural instinct in the community when we talk about the private sector being involved, is they're only doing it for them. I want you to break the paradigm in your own minds and say, no, there is actually a legitimate place, there is actually a legitimate role, and incentivizing, sorry, legitimizing incentivization at the macro level is just as good as legitimizing incentivization at the micro level as Mohammed Yunus did with Grameen Bank. I want us to make Melbourne the global expert of these three convergence points. I want us to be a truly innovative city and break a paradigm and build a brand image on us that will allow us to move forward, to steal Julia's phrase. Every time I'm saying moving forward nowadays, I think of Julia Gillard, so I really want to have a hard talk to her next time I see her, next time make it a different phrase. But we can really grab this nettle but it takes all of us to look into our community and society, look at what we've created together already in a very harmonious space, four million people in a rather large geographic spread from all sorts of cultures in the world. We are the global working example where you can come together in harmony with things. I'm guessing that's me. So let me wrap up. 
Innovation is something new. It's breaking a paradigm. The paradigm that I want you to break is the public sector delivery mechanism is the only way to do aid and development. It's not. It should be a component part, but we should build on our expertise of the private sector getting involved and make Melbourne the private sector version of Geneva. That's the innovation I want us to do moving forward. Thank you very much.